Thank you all for coming. Um, the idea of tonight is that, uh, is that you all have a, have a good night. And judging by the number of red eyes already, um, I'd say that it's, it's all happening. Um, there's a, a, a mildly, uh, you may or may not know that there's another event happening tonight. It's not nearly as significant as this event. Um, but but um, it is the, um, the 10th anniversary of the opening of the Sydney Olympic Games. And, uh, you know, some people think that's pretty big. Um, obviously, no one here thinks that. You're in the right place at the right event. Um, and, and I want to welcome you to, to this event. And we're hoping that we're going to hold one or two of these a year for, for forever, really. Um, um, this is the official launch of the dental specialists, and I'm, I'm going to say a little bit about the dental specialists at the end, um, but, but our team wants to welcome you now. Um, they're a happy bunch, and if you spot them around the place, they're, they're, they're in amongst you, incognito, out of uniform. So, you know, they're listening to what you're saying and all of that, so be careful. Um, but, but having... having you know, joined this organisation um, nearly two years ago now. It was a really big shift for me. Um, I came from a, my own practice where um, I essentially I had Julianne, who's here and probably desperately doesn't want me to mention her name. Um, <laughs> but um, Julianne, who's, who's, if you look around, she's the one slinking down in her seat right now. Um, she's been with me for, for um, just over 20 years. Um, and, and I'm going to pay her soon. Um, <laughs> and um, Yasu, who's my hygienist, who's been with me for more than 10 years, who's not here tonight um, because she's um, had a baby and apparently she needs more than a week off, which just seems... Yeah, I know, it's wrong. Um, um, but, but we had our happy little crew that was very, very stable and we only had to interact with each other and occasionally talk to a patient. Um, but you can get past that. Um, and, uh, and then I've joined this, the dental specialists and, and now I've got a whole bunch of people working with me and uh, a whole, both staff and dentists and all that. And it's very exciting. But it made me have a new look at, at communication. Because communication between Julianne and Yasu, well, actually, I don't understand anything Yasu says, even after 10 years. She's Japanese and I'm still a bit lost. Um, but Julianne understands every mumble that I make. If you ever saw us work in the surgery, you'd see, I, I sort of go, and she gives me the right instrument, you know, or occasionally I go, and she knows that it's a different instrument. I have no idea how she does that. Um, but, but now that there are more people, uh, I need to think about being understood, and mumbling apparently doesn't work for everybody. I have no idea why, really. Um, I've, I'm writing a mumble dictionary so that people know. But, but there's a little bit more to it. So, so I wanted to talk to you this evening um, about communication. And, and I've got a quote there, the map is not the world. And it's sort of a bit of an esoteric quote. Um, but, but what that's about is to say that we all have our own map of the world or of our world, but it isn't the world. It's just our own little map. And we need to try and get those maps to, to intersect. Um, when you look at that, I don't know what you're all seeing. Actually, I do know what you're all seeing. And I can tell you, because you're all over the age of five, that you're all seeing the same thing. And I'm not going to mention what that thing is, but you're wrong, because that's not what it is. What you're actually looking at is dolphins swimming. Doesn't help when I say that, does it? <laughs> that's what I love about this picture. Dolphin? Dolphin? Dolphin, dolphin, <laughs> still not happening? Okay. <laughs> so round about now, all the women can see dolphins and the men see exactly what they were seeing in the first place. Is there anyone left who hasn't seen a dolphin? If, if only I could live in your world. 
Okay, so it's easy to make errors when we're communicating visually, verbally, all of those sorts of things. And tonight I want to talk a little bit about trying to avoid those, those sort of errors. And I guess the first thing is that you need to become a good observer. None of you have passed that test so far, but I'm going to give you a few more chances. Becoming a good observer makes you a really good communicator because too often we are the one you are trying to communicate instead of letting someone communicate with you. If you try to understand someone before you try to be understood, you find it becomes easy. It works for people. You just listen and look and concentrate. And once you understand them, it's easy to make yourself understood. But most of the time, we go the other way. Now, if you're going to help to understand somebody or something, you need to try and eliminate distractions. So that means, and this doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you're talking to a friend, a partner, a patient. Are we allowed to call them patients or have they now become clients? If you're a dentist and you call them clients, put your hand up. Thank goodness. Because one of my clients complained about being called a patient. And I said, well, you don't have to be a patient, you know. You can go somewhere else. You need to eliminate distractions. In, in any situation, if you want to communicate with someone, it's really better. If you, you know, close the door, turn off the TV. I know that's radical. Take the headphones out of your ears. Stop playing on the internet. The number of times that I talk to someone on the phone these days and I can hear tap, tap, tap as I'm talking to them. And it gives you the opportunity to say all sorts of bizarre things. And they just go, yeah. And you go, OK. <laughs> You need to focus on the communication that you're having. You need to stop what you're doing. It's really difficult these days. We're all trying to do lots of things. Women see themselves as good multitaskers. And if that means that you can talk and listen at the same time, well, you do, but you don't actually listen. And men, you can't do either. So, you know, you're one worse off than the women. You need to look at the person you're talking to. Now, whether you came with someone or not, what I'd love you to do in a couple of minutes, without looking, think of the person who you're sitting next to, who I assume you've looked at for at least a second, and think, do I know what colour their eyes are? Do I know what shape their eyes are? Do I know what colour their hair is? Do I know whether they're wearing glasses or not? Do I know anything about the way they look? And what's really scary is if there are some partners sitting there thinking, Eye contact really helps. Men especially are bad at eye contact. There's an old theory about that men, because they're hunters and protectors, when they sit with a woman, they are looking around the room to protect her. You know, it's an instinct. <laughs> You've all got a terrific excuse now, haven't you, eh? Yeah. I thought those huge boobs were going to attack you, darling. <laughs> now, hopefully, you're becoming better observers than you were a few minutes ago. So the idea of this lecture is that you improve as we go through it. So you should all be able to count the four legs that the elephant has. You're wishing you didn't have that extra drink now, aren't you? <laughs> Yes, and, and those three people who are seeing the man and woman again, congratulations. <laughs> it's scary, isn't it? The longer you look, the worse it gets. OK, so if we're going to become better communicators, one thing we need to do is absorb what's going on in front of us. And when people are communicating with us, there are verbal patterns and there are nonverbal patterns. And the verbal patterns are the, uh, the simplest thing, is the way the words that they're using. Visual words, auditory words, kinesthetic words. And I'll expand on that in a second or two. And the nonverbal patterns are the sort of gestures they're making, like me. I'm throwing my hand around because I know there's at least one Italian in the audience and I'm trying to appeal to him. Their, their posture, facial expressions, your eye contact, space, touching, for which most dentists get into trouble these days. But let's look at this in a little bit more, uh, more detail. If we look at the verbal patterns, people generally speak in either visual, auditory, or kinesthetic verbal patterns. So that's not to say that they don't use all of them, but at any given time, people tend to use one more than the other. So that, so that most people use visual words about 60% of the time. So, so for instance, do you understand what I'm saying? And the response to that is something like, I see. 
And so, you know, I'm saying understand, which is actually a kinesthetic word, but the response is a visual word, I see. And one of the ways that you can use that is that when you hear somebody like that, you know when you, when you sit down with somebody that you've just met and you've got instant rapport? You know that feeling that I, I feel comfortable with this person? Well, that, you get that feeling because this person is like you. They speak a bit like you and they and they gesture a bit like you. And, and you see it with, a, with married couples. You, you can actually see, you go in a restaurant, sit, sit down, have a look at some couples, see which ones are getting divorced and which ones are staying together. It's, it's really easy. The ones that are staying together, you know, they pick their glass up at the same time. They dribble together. But if you're talking to someone and, and you're not, you don't feel you're communicating, move into their type of language. If they're using visual language, if they're using words like clear and bright and see and look, try try using the same words or similar words and you'll find that suddenly they connect with you. Whereas if you're using auditory words and they're using visual words, it's never quite right. To give you a dental example, and I apologise to all the non dentists Oh, by the way, hand up if you're a dentist. Hand up if you're a real person now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, only two dentists put their hand up, that's pretty poor. So if you, if you try and, you know, if we took a patient example, you know, don't you think your new crowns look lovely? See, that's all visual. And the patient says, yeah, they feel, they're so smooth. So they're using kinesthetic language. So you could, you could respond with something like, yes, and they've got lovely texture or something like that. You'd probably get into trouble, but, you know. <laughs> so let's see if you've got better. Now, what you do with this one is that you don't read the words, you try to say the colour. So the first one there is white, and the second one is blue, and the third one is yellow. So try to go through all those words saying the actual colour, not the word. See how far you can get before you blow it. Okay, so presumably none of you did all that well, judging by the noises. The nonverbal patterns are some of the more interesting ones. Like, people make gestures, have a look at their hand and arm movements. One of the simplest things is that an open hand means an open person in, in general. A closed hand or a fist, yeah, well, a fist is never a good thing. But people, you know, putting their hand across themselves in response to, you know, you make what you think is a really good suggestion. And they say, well... Yeah, that's possible. That's really them saying no, 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 no. Whereas if they open themselves, they're, they're accepting your suggestions or they're listening. Posture is something that, that can be important, but posture's easy to misconstrue. There's the old one about if the whole audience crosses their legs when you say something, that means they're disapproving. It could also mean that the chairs are really uncomfortable. So it's, it's hard to tell. Facial ex expressions are the ones that get misinterpreted the most. We tend to... Do, have any of you watched the TV show Lie to Me? You know, and they reckon they can tell everything from facial expressions. It's complete rubbish. Sorry, if you really enjoy the show, it's fantastic. It's highly accurate. But facial expressions, one of the things that we, we know is that you don't know your own facial expression. For years, I, I'd be treating patients and I'd be doing something, and patient would look and go, what's wrong? And I'd look at them, I'd go, nothing's wrong. And, it, and they'd say, it doesn't look like nothing's wrong. <laughs> and I'd sort of say, well, OK. <laughs> I didn't know what they were talking about. And then, you know, one day I saw what I was looking like and I had this studied expression of something seriously gone wrong. But I didn't know that. So you need to try and become aware of what your face looks like, especially when you're concentrating and you're thinking. Common habit for people when they're thinking is to turn away, close their eyes. When you do that, the person you're talking to thinks they're not interested, but it may be just your way of thinking. And then there's rules about eye contact and space and touching. You ever seen that little dance that people do when one person, the space thing is my favourite. There, there are some nationalities in particular that, that get very close to you. And Australians, English people, well, especially English people who believe you should be in another room when you're talking to them, Americans are very uncomfortable with close body language. Lots of Europeans and Asians kiss when they say hello. Two guys kiss each other on the cheek. Have you ever watched an American president meeting a Russian president? 
It's fantastic. Same thing happens every time the Russian president walks up and goes, kiss, kiss, and the American president's going, oh, shit, shit. <laughs> And, and so you need to be aware, if you're going to communicate well with someone, you should follow their rules. The, the space rule's hard. The touching rule is easy, guys. The touching rule should be easy. Don't touch if you haven't been touched first. But, but the, the space rule should be easy, except when someone's invading your personal space. We've all got our idea of what is a nice space. And you watch people, someone invades their space and, you know, they sort of step back and back and back and back, and it's quite... It's quite funny watching people do that. But you really, if you're going to communicate well with someone, you need to try and get into their space. And then there's the old thing about women and men. And, uh, you know, there's whole books written about the difference between women and men. But there's really not that many differences, except for the touching rules. The touching rules are a little bit different for women and men, and I'm not going to expand on that. One of the things to make someone feel comfortable when you're, <clears throat> when you're talking to them um, is, is what's called mirroring. Mirroring their movements makes people feel instantly comfortable. Again, if you go to a restaurant or anything like that and you watch people who are comfortable with each other, you're ama it's amazing how often they mirror each other's movements. And so that means, for instance, matching their stance or matching the way they're sitting. And it doesn't mean that you try and do it while they're doing it because that looks like mimicking. You know, you don't sort of go, OK, they're raising their glass, so I'll raise mine. Because people start to look at you going, what the hell is this person up to? You just, you just leave a little lag in there, you know? They raise their glass and you give them a couple of seconds and then you suavely raise yours. If they make a gesture, you can make a similar gesture but be a little bit more subtle than them. So, so if they do something like that and then you pretend you're in a mirror and go, do the same thing, they're just looking at you going, wow, this guy's weird. But you can do something, you know, just a little small movement that mirrors their movement. You can try to match their facial expressions, that's really dangerous. Because say they've got a facial tick, <laughs> and you're going, you know, aside from the fact that everybody else is now looking at both of you, they're not really happy with you. Matching of the voice is a really good idea. If you hear a really good salesman, for instance, you'll hear them, two minutes after starting to talk to somebody, they'll start to match the tone and the tempo and the volume of the voice. So if someone's talking quickly, that you talk faster. If someone's talking really slowly, you talk slower. Usually people talk at the speed they can process information. So that if someone's talking slowly, they need you to talk slowly. If you talk fast when they're talking slowly, they, they have difficulty catching up. As far as eye contact go and space and touching, I mentioned before you should use their rules, but I have to tell you that eye contact is a really good thing. People generally like eye contact. You don't have to stare at them, you know, you don't stare them in the eyes for 10 minutes. But if you give them eye contact when they're saying something, you're giving them positive reinforcement. In the same way that you should use somebody's name. It's incredibly powerful to use, to use somebody's name or to reinforce when they use their own a personal pronoun, for instance. There was a study done by a psychiatrist, I think back in the 50s, and what he did was he was, he was sitting, at his, sitting at his desk and interviewing people, and he had a, a notepad in his lap. And every time the, the client said, used a personal pronoun, like I, me, myself, mine, something like that, he would, he would look them straight in the eye, then look down and do something in his pad. And then he'd just look down after that and not do anything until their next personal pronoun. What he was doing in the pad was marking off that they'd used a personal pronoun and counting. What he found was that in the second 10 minutes, they, they had a 20 minute interview, in the second 10 minutes, on average, these people used five times as many personal pronouns as they did in the first 10 minutes. So if you want to reinforce something somebody's saying, you just need to, you know, don't look at them then when they say something that you want to reinforce, just look at them. And you can nod if you want, but you don't have to. Just give them some positive reinforcement. If you don't want them to keep saying something, that's not the time to look at them. You know, when your little, when your little kid is acting up and wants, wants to, you know, making a fuss, and then you look at them. So you're reinforcing that behaviour. I won't get into child behaviour. And then, finally, my favourite bit about physical mirroring is the idea of using a crossover. So you use an element of your behaviour to match an element of their behaviour. And uh, for instance, you know, if someone's talking in a certain rhythm, you can, you can 
just subtly nod your head in the rhythm of their speech. And, uh, and it just, they don't notice. You'd be surprised what people don't notice. You know, they're carried away with their own speech. Or you can use a little finger. You know, you can just be standing there and, you know, tapping a finger on you. I want you to all try this on each other later. You just tap a finger in time with someone's breathing, just gently. And then after a while, see what happens when you tap a bit faster. You'll get them. <laughs> and if you don't like them, just slow down the tapping until you just stop. <laughs> this is another little thing, rabbit or a duck. And the three guys who have still seen the man and woman, congratulations. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. <laughs> After the physical mirroring, there's also the, the idea of verbal mirroring. And, and here I mentioned before using their language, use visual language with the visual, a person who's using visual language, auditory with auditory, kinesthetic with kinesthetic. I, I said before, use their name. People love, you'd be surprised how much people love hearing their name. I'm lousy at this because I forget everybody's name. But you should use people's name. The best way to do this is that when you meet someone, you know, and you say, hi, this is Pete. Hi, Pete. Say, hi, Pete. How are you, Pete? You look good, Pete. We've never met, but Pete, you look the best I've ever seen you look. <laughs> and after that, you might, uh, if it were me, I'd probably think everybody in the room was Pete. But if you say their name, you'd be surprised how much people like you for saying, for saying your name and how much they don't like you when, you do, when you're like me. And you say, um, have you two met? OK, introduce yourselves. <laughs> One of the things, certainly when you're doing a, a dental interview or a medical interview, but, but any time you're talking to someone, it's a really good idea to repeat what they say. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but you'd be surprised how often you've misinterpreted or you've interpreted when you, when you shouldn't have. And just by repeating what they say, they get to have the chance to say, no, that's not what I said. Because you might think they said something and they get to respond to that. The other thing about repeating what they're saying and using a pause is that, is that you, you get a lot more information from someone doing that. For instance, in a, in a, in a situation where somebody, where you, say you're taking a medical history, do you have any allergies? No, I don't have any allergies. You don't have any allergies. Have you ever been to a hospital? No, I've never been to a hospital. Never been to a hospital. It's hard under that sort of pressure for someone to hold out with anything. You know, they'll end up telling you, no, but I, but I had an affair when I was here. <laughs> when you do ask someone a question, try not to interrupt the answer. We all do it. We all start, someone starts saying something to us, we go, but, 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 you know, would you stop talking while I'm trying to interrupt you, please? So it's a really good idea to just try to control yourself. The Japanese, Japanese people do this really well. They're really good at silence, and we could all learn to be good at silence. Silence is fantastic. You get a lot of information. And when you're not talking, which is tough for some of us, don't just wait around to speak. Some people listen, and some people hang around until they have their chance to speak. Try listening. It's amazing what you, can, what you can hear and what you can find out. And it might even change what you're going to say in, in response. And when you are listening, try not to judge people or judge what they're saying. And as, you know, for the dentists in the room, we're really good at making snap judgments. And it's a really bad idea. It's, it's really good just to listen as openly as you can. Once you've heard the whole story, if you've been open-minded, it may be a different story to the one that you assumed was, was going to happen. When you are listening, it's great to give people reinforcement that you're listening. I mentioned eye contact before. And uh, the other thing is, is, you know, make the odd noise. Not too much noise. But a little, you know, mmm, gee, ooh. <laughs> people like that. Uh, get it, try and get it appropriate, though, you know. <laughs> you know, when they say something bad, you don't look at them going, wow. <laughs> And, and you also should listen to what it is they're not saying, because very often you find out more about, if, you, if you're listening carefully, you find out what, what they're avoiding saying, and, and that gives you more information than what they're actually, actually saying. And when you finally do respond to all of this, try to be positive, because, you know, the human brain 
regardless of anything else, the human brain does positive much better than it does negative. You might think that negative works really well. You know, no, 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 it works on kids. No, 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 no. Yeah, all right, put it in the socket. Go on then. <laughs> but being positive works much better. To give you a simple example, I'm going to tell you not to think about a blue elephant for the next minute. So don't think about a blue elephant. Isn't that working well? <laughs> so try to be positive when, you, when, you, when you're talking to people. The next little topic I want to move on to is a bit special, dealing with anger. Not that anyone in this room would ever have anger, but I'm sure that you have to deal with anger on occasions. And, uh, and anger can be difficult to deal with, whether it's a, a partner or a, an acquaintance or a patient or, or whatever. It's always hard to know what, what to do. If it's a patient, I haven't put this here, but if it's a patient, do you all know what you should do with a patient who comes in angry? You know what works really well? Shake their hand, smile at them, and don't let go. They get so annoyed with the fact that they can't get annoyed with you while you're hanging onto their hand. It works really well. After you let go, they usually punch you out. But for that 30 seconds, you did really well with them. But first of all, if you've got someone who's angry, you know, don't ignore them. You know, if they're aiming their anger at you or they're aiming their anger at somebody else, but they, but they are referencing you, if you ignore them, you just make them more angry. So, so you're better off to, to let them, you know, not attack you, but, but to join them. Listen to them. Try not to judge them. Remember they're angry. They're not happy. Don't interrupt them. That's, you know, you don't want to become part of the reason that they're angry. You better just let them rant and rave if that's what they want to do. If they actually are interested in talking to you and not just venting to you, then repeat their story, but take the emotion out of it. So if someone's really angry about something that's happened with, you know, the, I was buying something and it broke and I tried to give it back and I waited in line and I was on the phone, and I was 20 minutes on the phone on hold and when I finally got on I was told I couldn't be helped, and, and which is, you know, normal scenario. And try and get out of them, well, here's the story separate from the emotion. Because if you can separate the emotion, sometimes people will look at the actual story and think, well, it's not that big a deal. And you've, you've already got rid of some of their anger. And in the same vein, you should try and identify the problem, not just the complaint. Because the complaint and the problem are not necessarily, well, aren't the same thing. Sometimes, yes, you're unhappy about this, but how is it affecting you? Again, I'll give you a dental example. Dentists love, love it when they, someone's lost a tooth and they get to replace it. And, and they're really good at identifying the complaint. Even if the patient doesn't have one, the patient comes in, how long have you been missing this tooth? 48 years. Do you know how bad that is for you? Uh, not really. Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> you just can't go around without a tooth. Why? Because I have a payment on the car coming up and I need to do something about this space. But are they having a problem? If you can identify the problem that they're having, that's the thing that you can talk to them about or, or try and help them with. When someone's angry, it's a really good idea not to look away from them, not to be distracted. Just look straight at them. I know it's hard. If you're finding it too hard to look at their eyes, you know, look at their forehead. If it's a guy, you might have to keep looking higher and higher and higher, but that's okay. And you, you'd be surprised how much it calms people down that they're being taken seriously. And then you might come to the point, in a, especially if you're having a disagreement with someone, that you think to yourself, or you might say to them, even more dangerous, why can't you see I'm right? Have you all said that sometime in your life? Why can't you see I'm right when you're having an argument? Never? <laughs> Good on you. If you're thinking that, then you've got to be thinking, that's exactly what they're thinking. We're both thinking the same thing. Why can't you see I'm right? Which means we're either, you know, both right or both wrong, but there's no point arguing about it. It's like, okay, we disagree. If you're going to try some mirroring during a, an argument or if someone's angry, um, mirroring is really fun, I can, I've got to tell you. you don't, you're not listening to a word they're saying, you're just looking at their body language. You know, so they're going, rah, 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 and you're just thinking, what are they doing with their leg? What's, what's happening there? And you mirror the things that are in control, though. If you, think, if you mirror the things that are out of control, you'll just make them angrier. So you don't throw your hands around or stuff like that. But if you notice that something about them is in control and you try and mirror that, you can calm them down. You need to be empathetic, obviously. And don't assume that you're being asked for help. 
you might be being asked for help, but a lot of the time you're not being asked. You're just being used as a sounding board. And it's, it's a really bad habit to assume that people want you to fix their problem. Again, guys are the worst at this. Guys are problem solvers. And they assume that when someone is angry and upset, that what they want is a solution. They don't always want a solution. As a matter of fact, most of the time, they don't want a solution. They just want to be listened to. So you might ask, you might say, do you want me to help? Can I do anything to help? And if they say no, then don't, because you've already helped. OK, another little test, because you're all looking like you need one. Um, and what I want you to do, some of you have probably already done this, but um, I know some of you have done this, so keep it to yourself. But in the next slide, I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of time to count how many um, Fs there are in the, uh, in the, in the next slide. OK, that's enough time. Um, if you've already done this before, you shouldn't really be competing. But anyone see no Fs? Thank goodness for that. Um, does anyone see one F? Two Fs? Be proud. Come on. Three Fs. Come on, come on. Hands up, hands up. That's quite a lot of people. Four Fs. Only one more. Five Fs. Six Fs. And the Cupid doll goes to the six Fs. One, two, three, four, five, six. And your partner has two eyes, one nose, and one mouth, for those of you who need help. Okay, I'm, I'm going to... Um, finish this presentation by just um, with a little short um, bit of what do you call it? Ad marketing? What is it, Gordon? Marketing or an ad? The truth. The, tr oh, the truth. Even better. I'm going to tell you the truth about the dental specialists. Um, w what we are is a is a purpose designed multidisciplinary specialist dental team. I started with this um, going on two years now. Even though we're having our launch now, which shows you how slow I am at everything. Um, but, but we've been putting the right team together and, um, and now I think we've got a, a terrific team of, of um, a number of different specialists who, who work both individually and as a team. And that concept is sometimes hard for dentists to cope with, um, but I can tell you that the patients think it's fantastic. I know that many of my patients who I used to send all over Sydney for treatment um, now are thrilled with the idea that when I say to them, you know, that periodontist is just down the hall. Um, they just think all of that sort of stuff is fantastic. And um, so, so, you know, for the patients who need um, more than one specialist, it's, it's convenient. Um, we want to be a resource for, for all of you. Um, obviously, we, we welcome your referrals for treatment. Um, you can refer patients just for diagnosis and, and treatment planning. Um, we have a, we have a cone beam scanner so that um, you can just send patients in for cone beam scans to find out that there really was no bone when you thought there was really no bone. Um, we're there to give you expert help and advice. Um, expert might be an exaggeration. We can give you help and advice and disavow all knowledge of having spoken to you if it turns out badly. Um, and, and we're developing into a, a centre for, for testing and clinical research. So, you know, we use patients for human tests. We don't tell them. Um, they work it out when they grow extra bits. Um, so that's really everything I wanted to say to you tonight. And I just want to end the way we, we started because we had an opening ceremony, although most of you missed it. So um, we should also have a closing ceremony. Um, thank you very much again for coming here. I want to also thank our sponsors, um, 3MSB, Kerr, Horaeus, uh, Henry Schein, Hallis and Serona um, for providing the iPads. Don't forget you're all in the draw um, to, to win one of five iPads tonight. And um, um, what I'd like to ask you now is, is we're going to have some more drinks and some more food. And then um, um, we're going to have the draw in about 25 minutes or so. And then after that, you're, you're welcome to go and, and visit 
the art exhibition and to, um, you know, and I, I mentioned this to a few people, but it's the last night of the exhibition. Um, they've got some up-and-comers, like you see there, Whistler, Monet, Cezanne, Matisse, Picasso. You get to take one picture with you tonight to help the art gallery clean up at the end of the exhibition. So thank you again for your attention.